the two things that meant the most to me was duty and honor. There has to be a leader, and the leader is responsible for what happens, be it good or bad. Once a battle starts, you can't stop it. It was my men that won the battle that day. People that have died here gave their lives the North and the South were called that they believed in. When I was told I was taking it over, they sent a major in to tell me, and I actually thought I was either being relieved or arrested, because I don't care for the politics outside the government, and I darn sure don't care for the politics within the Army. General George Meade was given command of the Army of the Potomac just two days before the battle at Gettysburg began. I guess I was either the best of the worst choice or the worst of the best choice. The armies of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac had been battling on Virginia soil for two years. There was nothing left. Wild animals themselves, rabbits and, and things like that, had been basically almost were extinct. Cattle and everything else was been, had been eaten up. We see all this corn, the great crops of corn and wheat, and, and so let's go north and take advantage of that. Now, while we're up there, we'll probably engage those people. General Robert E. Lee had served alongside General Meade during the Mexican-American War. Both were graduates of West Point. Now each would be pulled into a battle they hadn't planned as adversaries at Gettysburg. My concerns are, when we first came into Pennsylvania, our army was split up in different areas. In that particular position, we were very vulnerable. I arrived in Gettysburg on June 30th. General Meade actually was trying to get a battle going further south but I recognized the heights around Gettysburg, the lay of the land, and I said, this is a better place for a battle. If we're gonna go, this is where we're gonna go at. Powell Hill and I were in the Cash Down area when we began to hear uh, weapons fire, and we moved, uh, I, I uh, tried to find out what that was, and it, uh, we find out that General Heath has engaged some of the advanced elements of, uh, of the Union Army. And in an effort to dislodge them and, and become victorious over them, he throws in more troops. And so by the time, by early afternoon comes, uh, uh, all available resources to Powell Hill with the Third Corps have been, have been thrown into battle against the Union forces there. I had received orders at that time from Reynolds that, you know, it looks like there's a major engagement gonna happen here. Hold the town as long as you can. So that's what we did. But I was terribly outnumbered, and I was slowly getting pushed back through town, um, basically getting overran. I would climb up there every now and then because I had a good view of the battlefield. While I was up there, General Reynolds pulled up, reined up, said, uh, you know, what's going on, John? <laughs> and, and I said, it's hell to pay. We're, we are getting overran. I need help. We can't let up now. We've, we've, we've done just what I didn't want to do. We weren't. Uh, were spread out. I didn't want to get involved in a general engagement, but yet here we are. And so at this point, all we can do is press it. General Meade was still south of town, so Major General John Reynolds took command of the battle for the Union. Within minutes, the well-respected and newly married general was struck in the head by a Confederate bullet. He died instantly. The end of the first day, I left Tawny Town about 10.30 in the evening, I arrived here at 11.30, lost a good pair of glasses too coming in. Knocked, it, knocked them right on the tree limb, knocked my glasses off. Luckily I had a spare pair. We came in, I went out the Cemetery Hill, met with Hancock, we talked. I rode along Cemetery Ridge, see where our positions were. The first day of the battle went to the Confederates. We, we had a good day today, General. I mean, obviously we saw what we were presented with this morning and took advantage of it. But Union troops had held their high ground and they were massing. General Lee had no way of knowing what he was up against. He'd sent his expert cavalry officer, General Jeb Stewart, forward to investigate. But Stewart had not returned. Well, what are your numbers? What are the numbers that you've got between all of you? Well, we've lost, the General Johnson is fresh. He's just arrived into the town, so we've got a whole division that is ready. General Early here, if I could speak. Go ahead. 
I I've mean, got, I know I've got, he, I've got four brigades. Now, how, what time in the morning can you be ready? We can be ready at dawn. Crack a light. Okay, then that's what I'll tell Pete, that, that we'll be looking at dawn on, on the 2nd. Okay. On, on tomorrow. Because I hear the sound of his guns, we will demonstrate. Good, we'll good. We'll have those good. Yankees, sir. Okay, very well, very well. We got the orders around 4 p.m. on July the 2nd, and we had just made it to the summit of Little Round Top before the Confederates started coming up the hill. Like a wave, they would crash up the hill, hit us, then go back down, then they come back up again a little bit, and this continued for roughly about two hours. We was running low on ammunition, pretty much out of ammunition. We couldn't leave the battle, we couldn't leave the left flank. Um, if we stood there and just waited for them to come up, they would just overrun us. So that's when we ordered the bayonet charge. We swept them down the hill, moved them out, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, a professor of rhetoric at Bowden College, would receive the Medal of Honor for his actions on Little Round Top. But others claimed credit for turning the tide in favor of the Union on the second day of battle. We stopped Longstreet. Stopped him good. It was my men that won the battle that day. General Dan Sickles was a well-known politician of his time. Once judged temporarily insane in the shooting death of Philip Barton Key, the son of Francis Scott Key, after Sickles caught him having an affair with his wife. Some Union soldiers wondered if the insanity defense should have disqualified him as a wartime general. Others thought him even crazier when he took his wife back. At Gettysburg, he disobeyed Meade's orders to stay put away from the front line. Now, I was still stuck with an order from General Meade to stay around Pipe Creek and guard the roads in case of a retreat. Retreat, we don't retreat in front of the Confederates. So I sent my men forward. I sent them to the sound of the guns. Lost a leg that day to Cannonball. Good 12-pounder hit me. But I was going to make sure that when I left the field, it did not demoralize my men, because a lot of men are demoralized when they see their commander being taken off. So they put me on a stretcher, I said, get a cigar out of my pocket. And I just put it there, or I cut down, and they, my men saw that I was still alive, still in command. They took me to the field hospital. Doctor took my leg off right above the knee. Now, of course, I was under chloroform at the time. But the medical uh, department had been wanting samples of battlefield wounds so they could study them back in Washington. So I sent them my leg. And if you go down there to the medical museum today, you can go visit my leg. And in fact, after the war, Sickles paid regular visits to his own leg. Finest leg bone they have there, I t can tell you that. General Meade would not put me back in command. He didn't want me. And quite honestly, I didn't want to serve under General Meade any further either. I didn't care for Sickles and I didn't care for Butterfield. Dan Butterfield was Meade's chief of staff. Although he undermined Meade by creating false documents, making it appear that Meade ordered a retreat at Gettysburg. Meade says Butterfield worked alongside Sickles, pulling off all sorts of wartime shenanigans. At Chancellorsville, I went down to headquarters and I opened the door and I looked over and to my left, half the building was headquarters and Half the building was Bordello. You know, those people, they wanted to party. I got so disgusted, I walked out, I slammed the door, I went back to my tent and wrote my wife a letter about the, the politicians in the Army. As the sun rose on the third day of battle, the Union had massed thousands of troops on top of Cemetery Ridge. But General Lee was convinced he could squeeze the Union into a retreat. Despite warnings from his second-in-command, General Pete Longstreet, Lee called for a massive attack. General Richard Ewell from the north and General Stewart finally back from his failed forward mission from the rear. Longstreet, in command of General George Pickett, was to engage uphill head-on. And if, if all had gone as planned, uh, we'd have been able to literally cut their army in half. These, all of them on this side would have been our prisoners. The rest of the army would have said, well, this, we, we need to make, we need to readjust our thinking here. And they'd have began moving back toward Washington City. But Stewart, exhausted from his wild reconnaissance ride, was stopped by the Union's Brigadier Generals George Custer and David Gregg. 
Yule ran out of ammunition, so the charge was left mostly to picket. Get their ammo supply up, because if we hit Gettysburg and they need us right away, I want to be on the field as quick as we can. Well, we formed our battle line at 1 o'clock when the cannonade started, and it ran until 3. So I rode over to Long Street and asked him if I should move out, move my men out. And he didn't say anything, and I asked him again, and he finally gave me a nod, yes. So I rode off and went to my men and rallied them for the charge. I'm sending them out into cannon fire from all positions of the Union line. So our plan fell apart. Once a battle starts, you can't stop it. Well, the cannon were still firing at me <laughs> and the cannon. I got knocked off my horse right as Armistead hit. So I saw the Virginia flags up and moving across the wall. And by the time I got back on my feet and, and could see what was happening, my flags had already fallen. General Pickett did come up. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned uh, we had a brief discussion and, and um, uh, I, I just told him what I, what I felt and that, that, that it was all my fault. I'm, you know, there has to be a leader, and the leader is responsible for what happens, be it good or bad. We would do this for 24, 48 hours, sometimes even more. There'd be an assembly line. I would do legs only. Another surgeon would have the arms. In just three days, more than 27,000 Union and Confederate troops were wounded. Those deemed viable in the field were brought to a medical tent. The most common treatment was amputation. He has an open fracture of the foot. Any open fracture constituted the removal of the limb. What we would start off with would be chloroform or ether. The hospital steward, Kathy, would provide that via a ether cone. We would instruct the soldier to breathe deeply for about 10 seconds, after which they would become unconscious, fall asleep, and be pain-free. The surgeon had eight to 10 minutes to get the leg off and the stump stitched before the soldier came out of the ether. The capital knife will go through the muscle, the skin, and any blood vessels to the bone, okay, from the top and from the bottom. At which time, the hospital steward would take this, wrap it tight, and pull this back, which would expose the bone, okay? Once the bone was exposed, I would take the capital saw, make five or six passes, the limb would be severed, this limb would be thrown into a pile, of limbs and discarded. The bone would be filed to prevent sharp edges from causing future discomfort. The wound sutured and the soldier whisked off to awaken in quite a lot of pain. At this point, the, the surgeon would clean some of the instruments with a bucket of uh, bloody water, which wouldn't be changed for maybe a dozen, uh, you know, soldiers. We simply go like this on their clothes or on their apron okay, and get right into the next soldier. Dysentery claimed more lives than battle. Thousands succumbed to disease caused by unsanitary camp conditions. This would be um, nice accommodations, let's put it that way. I, uh, I'm a private. We try to stay clean uh, for the most part. 
you can see how sanitary my food is carried. <laughs> so this might be a reason. But for instance, when I mix up, if I'm going to mix some flour dough or something, this is what I mix it on. But it works. You know, you put that down and uh, get some dough out and some water from the canteen. Mix up. Put it in there. And you got it. So you know, there might be a reason I get diarrhea from time to time. <laughs> Troops might march 20 miles in a day just to get to the fight, so they traveled light. I like to say I'm a high private because I have this fine thing here. This is actually uh, Yankee stuff. This is a piece of shelter half, Yankee shelter half. They started making these for the Yankee Army in 1862. By this time of the war, we got as many of them as they do by taking them from them. If they couldn't carry it, they didn't have it. So you had basically the clothes you wore until they fell off of you. An extra pair of socks, maybe. I always try and carry that because you need those. But uh, most, maybe another shirt, but that's about all the men had. So I've got my home, I've got my kitchen, and then the fighting part. And in this case, it's an 1861 Springfield. Probably the most commonly used weapon out here. There's not going to be a cooked meal. General Pickett was allowed six wagons for his personal property. The tables, they all fold up for easy storage because you didn't want to take up a lot of room in a wagon. The trunks would store more. I had my desk, which would keep my military objects in, my maps and that. Got this from the native tribe who I married. The, uh -huh. the morning dove was her name. Uh -huh. And her father was a chief. So he gave me this knife. And then she died, and then who'd you marry after that? Uh, Sally Corbell Pickett, after Pickett's ch after Gettysburg was done, mm -hmm. September of 63, I was afraid I wasn't going to make it through the war mm -hmm. because of what happened at Pickett's charge. Uh -huh. And I told her to get everything ready to be married, so we got married in September. Do you, George, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Civil War weddings were simple affairs and, like any wartime union, made more meaningful by the groom's impending trek to the battlefield. It's simple. Um, it honors God. And uh, it's, uh, it, it asks the right commitment from the people. Well, for instance, it's love, honor, and obey. It's not love, honor, and cherish. A wife, daughter, or sister in battle wasn't uncommon. For some women, war was an adventure a way to get off the farm. They disguised themselves so that you couldn't tell that they were women. They cut their hair short. Uh, they would wear binders around their breasts so that uh, you couldn't tell that they were women. And they fought side by side with the men. And, and many times the, the men knew that they were women. The commanders turned a blind eye a lot of times to the fact that they were women because the attention to detail that they gave, especially to our artillery crews, um, was phenomenal. Fire! Load. <laughs> Cavalry can move out quickly, out in front of the main body, which moves pretty slowly. Cavalry can move all over and find the enemy much easier than, than dismounted folks can. And we can move pretty fast. Once we find them, then we hold them for a while. And the way we hold them is to dismount. So when we dismount, typically we operate in groups of four. So three men will dismount, they'll link their horses together, and the fourth man will hold, hold the horses. Normally, the cavalry was armed with a carbine, which is a short rifle. They had six-shooter pistols, Remingtons and Colts, and they had the saber. So they were pretty heavily armed. I'm a captain of the Wolfolk Rangers. They came out of Culpeper, Virginia. We were the first company in, and uh, of course they had a trap set for us. The Yankees, they lured us up there. They had, they were, the, their mounted men were across the ridge. And their uh, dismounted were hidden behind a fence in a pile of rocks. Well, usually when you're in an ambush, the best tactic is to is to, to attack, so you can get out. Um, most ambushes are set up so if you retreat, you get it worse, um, and that's basically what we did. Once we got hit, we charged in and then pulled out as quick as we could and saved as many men as we could. Of course, yeah, we would have lost quite a few.
caring for horses, cleaning guns, finding and preparing food, all part of life behind the lines. Evenings occasionally brought time for entertainment. Yeah, it was an important part of the war. You know, camp bands and, you know, fiddle players, fife players, banjo players. You know, it's America's instrument. What else could you do at night, you know, uh, for the guys to get together and, you know, the guy would carry one of these with him, I might carry a fiddle. You had your martial instruments, you know, fife and drum, they might join in. Uh, somebody beat on a tin cup for percussion, you know, they play popular songs of the day. You have to keep the morale up somehow. What we're going to be portraying is when, when that first engagement started, uh, the Federals did a pretty good job of holding the Confederate line at that point near the creek and near the ridge. Water and ice would be there in the activities tent from there. At Federal headquarters, commanders meet in the wings of the battle theater, coping with the tales of the day's scenario. You know, you look at a battle the size of Gettysburg, uh, it would be impossible to portray the entire thing. So we do aspects of certain battles and, uh, you know, the things that the history has been written very detailed about. And, of course, we have records for, for all of this and, and, you know, after action reports and, and eyewitness accounts and, and, you know, the actual participants. So, you know, we can go to a pretty, you know, detailed level uh, if we have the numbers for it. Reenactment producers and directors spend months drafting scripts, taking into account things like weather. Today, it'll top 100 degrees. The number of wool clad reenactors waiting for their cues and how each can get their time in the warp. If there wasn't a lot of cab action, say, in Pickens Charge, we still have to incorporate them in the scenario somehow because, you know, they're, they've got as much money, time, and effort into coming out as we do, and they need to have uh, an opportunity to play as well. Attention! Our dismounts are going to go out with the cav. They're going to go out first. We're going to hold the first and second division in the woods back here. When they start to engage, then General Daniels, General Police are going to bring those guys. Artillery going the whole time, of course. Yeah. That's what I told those guys to keep it hot. The other thing I said, told our guys was if they see something changing, act and react to it. I mean, it's scripted within, but you know. Uh, you know, if Brian goes to throw the punch, throw the punch back or block the punch. <laughs> so, other than that, we should be set to go. We usually have a, a scripted scenario that we're going to follow. Sometimes it works the way it's planned, and very often it doesn't, uh, just like the real army. Dismounted cabs send out already? Yeah, we did. I don't know where they went, though. We had Buford's <laughs> cow coming. Ordinarily, when things weren't quite so hot, we'd be spending more time uh, drilling and uh, we're usually uh, a lot busier than we are here, just mostly because of the oppressive heat. Some days, taking a bullet is the key to survival. If you had a nice tree that you could uh, conveniently uh, die under, that would be a different story. But uh, the way it is now, you're laying there in the, in the sun, and if your unit marches off, you're left behind, you can't even, can't even move. So what a lot of the people will do, they'll, they'll be more of a, a mobile wounded. You'll see them using their gun as a crutch. They'll be helping themselves off the field, uh, heading always for shade. And behind the scenes, there's little loyalty. I ride both sides. I like to be on the side that's outnumbered. So if, if, the, if we got the Yankees outnumbered, I'll put blue on and go help them. Or if the Yankees got us outnumbered, then I'll stay with my gray. Veterans of modern wars emerge from their realities to dip back into the past. I got tired of jumping from job to job, so I joined the Navy. And after boot camp, everyone started asking me, you know, what do you do in your spare time? Oh, I, I do civil war enactments. So like, well, don't you get enough of the military? Not really. It, it's a different atmosphere out here. After spending 23 years in the Army, I might as well stay in. At least now I'm a general. <laughs> so I joined the military. I joined the Air Force in 80 and until 86. I, I'm a retired Army officer and I was in the Armored Cavalry, so it's in my blood. Well, I was in Special Forces um, for a couple years. I was a tanker, 
as among other things, a tank crewman, and I was also a red-eye gunner. In the end, they all eventually leave the past behind. You can find me at just um, www.generalrelee.com. Wars come a long way. Unfortunately, we haven't learned how to avoid them. You know, if we'd have had these, yeah. okay, it'd been a whole different ball game. The guy that played Buford just stepped up to General Meade. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna try for that part. So I actually have to dye my hair now. And <laughs> I'm pretty much gray. It's emotional that people had, had died here, gave their lives. I mean, the North and the South, I mean, for a cause that they believed in, just to, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sobering to me. He was just an interesting character. He was a Tammany Hall politician, Democrat from New York. We're kind of like a family. We all do this to, to teach the history and try to keep people informed on uh, what happened back then and why. Well, we're going to say yes, he did. He did make it. His leg's a little shorter, but he, he made it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lots of things. I've gotten dysentery. I've gotten pneumonia. I've gotten every kind of bug bite you can think of. Of course, you know, every, every little boy wants to be a cowboy, so... So, I, I liked riding around with the guns and the swords and, and playing, playing hard. It was, it was fun. I just kept on big toys, you know, big boys and big toys. Uh, so in some ways you could say they were tougher, but when I look at what our soldiers are doing now, the basic soldier is the same guy.